Good morning. I'm Dr. Gamby, and Dan has given me this opportunity to, to share some insights with you and, and uh, maybe talk to you about some principles of health. I, I think if you understand principles, and like Dan and I were just talking, uh, I'm going to mispronounce this Greek philosopher's name, but is, I think is uh, Thyusides. But he said the, the secret of happiness is freedom. I think we can agree upon that, but then he went on to say the secret of freedom is courage. And I'm going to add my little and endurance because you can have courage for a short period of time and that's great, but you've got to endure or, <coughs> or it won't last. And so Dan just brought up the idea, yeah, it's scary because a doctor says you've got cancer. <coughs> and so what do you do? Well, we usually panic and then we do whatever that doctor suggests, whether or not he really knows what he's talking about or not. <coughs> Uh, uh, so anyway, it reminded me of a phone call I had this week from a lady who, uh, whose father had cancer. He had lung cancer and it had spread and he was a very sick man and <clears throat> so she went to the doctor and the doctor recommended that he uh, have chemotherapy. Well, if you look at the survival rates for chemotherapy and lung cancer, they're less than zero uh, for five years. I know that's that's not true, but they're very, very low. <laughs> well, she went, they went ahead of it out of fear because the doctor assured her that it might work and there's nothing else they could do. Well, that's, that's not true either. <clears throat> but anyway, the, the, the drug burned a hole in his esophagus, and so this very sick man had fluid leaking into his lungs from his esophagus. He then underwent a, a very difficult procedure where they reroute the esophagus, um, and it, it's very frustrating to see those sorts of things happen when, uh, although metastatic lung cancer is a very serious condition, there are other very non-toxic ways that people are having success with. <clears throat> and then uh, the courage part is also was manifest or, uh, to me when I was in Salem this week talking to uh, legislator about alternative forms of medicine and she was somewhat enthusiastic about it because she had a good experience with homeopathy when her children were small and her her daughter apparently had dermatitis and the doctor says oh you've got to take these drugs and she said no I think I'll try a homeopathic remedy and the doctor then uh, in my opinion threatened her he said to her if you do that you're gonna, you're killing your daughter well she had the courage to stick with her convictions, and she probably also realized that uh, there really isn't a good traditional treatment for eczema in, in children, and so she went away to the homeopathic remedy and got good results. Now, she wouldn't have gotten those good results unless she had had understanding, knowledge, and courage, and so it takes a combination of those things. If you hoped to have the happiness that comes with freedom, which also requires knowledge. And another very important reason for you to do that is because, I don't know if this will show up very well, but this is published in the New England, you no, know, the Journal of the American Medical Association. And it was uh, commented on by Dr. Mercola on his website, mercola.com. But this is 11 years ago. And as you can see from this headlines, going to the doctor is one of the great risk factors in our culture today. A very excited about it. one of the email jokes I got at about the same time was that uh, they quoted the number of uh, doctors in the country, the number of people, and the number of deaths from going to the doctors. And they compared to that with the number of guns and the number of people <coughs> that died from accidental gunshot wounds. And the figures, the numbers say that you're 15 times more likely to die from a doctor visit than you are from an accidental gunshot wound. Now that's, I'm not sure, I didn't double check those figures. <clears throat> but you need to take responsibility. So maybe over the next few weeks, if we get doing this a little more regularly, <clears throat> we'll, we'll talk about what we call a paradigm shift, a little bit of a different approach to thinking about health and disease. You know, if we go back two or 300 years, or maybe just back to the time of George Washington. Uh, George Washington got sick uh, after he had sort of retired from public office and and uh, the traditional treatment at that time was uh, 
cathartics or something that gives you diarrhea and bloodletting. Well, they applied those to George Washington and he died. Well, okay, today we'd say that's uh, malpractice. If we go back even further, uh, if we ask people, if we took a survey and said, uh, what causes disease 200 years, 300 years ago? We would, uh, most people would say evil spirits, night air, uh, bad humors, evil spirits, you know, all these things, which we know now are to be false. Well, uh, once antibiotics were invented, and, and even before that, when uh, the microscope was discovered, you'd, you'd see an infection, you'd, you'd look at it under the microscope, and you'd see lots of little bugs. And so then the idea came along that bugs cause infection, bugs cause disease. Uh, and so for years now, uh, that's been the, uh, um, the thinking, and it still is today. You get a bladder infection, you take antibiotics. You get pneumonia, you take antibiotics. Now, antibiotics have a place, and in acute situations, <clears throat> they're very important. But when we talk about chronic antibiotic use, it's obvious that we are not identifying the cause of the problem, because now we're seeing that it isn't the bug. And there's a, a t tale, and I'm not sure how accurate it is, that <clears throat> there was uh, about the time of Pasteur and, and bugs and vaccination and all that, uh, the Paris Medical Society <clears throat> was having a debate. And Pasteur was saying bugs cause disease, and his uh, sort of his uh, debate <clears throat> opponent was a fellow by the name of Beauchamp, and he said, no, it's not the bug, it's the environment the bug finds itself in. And so they debated back and forth and passed your one. And so you've heard of him and very few people have heard of Beauchamp. But Beauchamp is right. <clears throat> it's, not the it's not the bug that causes the disease. It's the environment we create <clears throat> that allows a bug to flourish. And some, there's some thinking out there that, uh, that you create an environment that will determine whether or not you have a viral infection, a bacterial infection, or a yeast infection. And so it's very interesting thinking, but we don't need to go there. The point I want to make is part of this paradigm shift we all need to go through, <clears throat> which makes it much easier for us to take responsibility for our health, is that if you give your body a chance, it can do a lot towards healing itself. Because the real cause of aging is malnutrition. Now, injuries play a huge role. But you can, let's take an example. <clears throat> let's say we all jump off the roof, or let's say we all jump off a 10-foot fence. Now, a healthy person, a young person, will jump off and run away. As we get older, our ability to jump off, jump off and run away diminishes. And most of us, if we jumped off a 10-foot fence, would need to call 911. And that's because our bodies have worn down, they've become less elastic, less flexible, our bones are more brittle, our muscles are stiffer, and much of that is due to malnutrition that's developed over a period of time. Now, one of the major <coughs> nutrients that we lose as we age <coughs> is magnesium. Now, you won't be able to see this, but this came out of a very fascinating book called The Kellogg Report that was published about 30 years ago. <clears throat> and he talked about nutrition and diet and, and disease in America. It was, it was a landmark publication, but most people haven't heard about it. But <clears throat> this little sheet talks about the effect of milling on whole grains. Now, it, <clears throat> now most people, uh, even though some people, um, a large percent of the population, are now going to whole foods, <clears throat> you can see that the number one up here if you take chromium and magnesium, magnesium, let's look at just magnesium. We go down here to magnesium, down here. You'll see that in the milling process, it removes 85% of the magnesium. So a piece of bread you buy in the grocery store, the white flour, even though it's, quote, un enriched, end quote, has had at least 85% of the magnesium removed. Now, if you look at the enriched ingredients, Rarely do you see magnesium. Now, if you go, go, go through life with a magnesium deficiency, your risk of developing a chronic disease increases dramatically. For an example, I recently uh, happened to think about this book called Excitotoxins. <clears throat> now, currently we have a, essentially an epidemic 
of magnesium deficiency. No, we don't call it that. We call it ADHD, we call it ADD, we call it Parkinson's disease, we call it Alzheimer's, we call it dementia, we call it hypertension, we call it coronary artery disease. All of these, in all of these conditions, magnesium plays a significant role. Now with the, <clears throat> the neurodegenerative diseases, let me just show you here if we could. All of us are inundated, unless we make a conscious effort to avoid it. We're inundated with chemicals we call excitotoxins. Nutrasweet, aspartamine, MSG. These things stimulate brain cells. Now, if you stimulate a brain cell too much, it actually dies. And here's a picture of actual drawing of, of you can see this. On, the, <clears throat> on your left, you'll see a high dose exposure. This is a brain cell. A high dose exposure to an excitotoxin. And this is, uh, oh, as time progresses, this happens. So you can see a high dose of excitotoxin actually kills brain cells. Now it isn't going to do it immediately. It takes time. You know, if you lose 10 brain cells, you, you, uh, you aren't going to notice it. If you lose 10 a day, you probably won't notice it because we have billions of cells. But I think you've, you've probably all read uh, the, the concern there is now for concussions in young boys. You see the results of, of uh, professional football players who get repeated head injuries. You, we we're probably all familiar with Muhammad Ali, who, uh, the professional boxer who now has uh, some form of neurodegenerative disease and he has difficulty walking and talking and things of that nature. Now, the interesting, one of the interesting things, that's very interesting by itself, but the point the book goes on to make is if we're magnesium deficient, our cells are even more sensitive to these excitotoxins than if we have adequate magnesium intake, which I'd venture to guess that no one has enough magnesium. And so when we have deficiencies and we have pollution, and this is especially true, you know, autism now occurs in less, I mean, there's more than, I'm not sure I can get these numbers right. One child in a hundred now has autism and the number is even larger than that. And so it's an epidemic. And unfortunately, uh, if you have a child with autism, your life is never the same. And it probably could have been prevented if we paid attention to some of this stuff. This book is 30 years old. And most of us in the medical profession have never heard of it. So, this gets us back to the idea, if we're adequately nourished. Now, the other is we have to be adequately nourished. Uh, I'm just totally full of all this great information. <laughs> you may not be able to. If, if any of you would like some of this more, uh, this information, send me a self-addressed stamped envelope, and I'll send you a copy of, of the particular stuff. If you want to send me a buck for copying, uh, that'd, that'd be great, too. Uh, but what this points out is that we're all iodine deficient. Now, but we aren't chlorine, chlorine deficient, we aren't bromide deficient, and we aren't fluoride deficient. And these are chemically very similar to iodine. Iodine is critical for good health. It's important for your thyroid, it's important for your breast, it's important for the prostate. Now, when we aren't adequately nurtured with iodine, then we get in trouble women get bumpy breasts and men get prostate and it's not just those things that's one of the major factors but this what this graph shows is as you increase your iodine intake you increase your secretion of fluoride chloride and bromide and i think that's critical and especially timely i think because if we were adequately nourished with iodine we wouldn't be running out to find potassium iodide pills to protect us from the possible contamination from the fallout from the nuclear disaster in Japan. You can, it's very difficult to even find iodine now on the, uh, the stores and uh, the shelves in the health food stores. But if you had been 
following the guidelines we've tried to give you over the last 10, 15 years, you'd be taking iodine. But if you can't get iodine, get kelp or seaweed or things like that. Very interesting aside, <clears throat> I was recently reading the book John Adams. Uh, I think it's a, I found it a fascinating book. But he lived in New England. And a tradition at that time, and it's just something that most people did, was each summer they would go down to the coast in their wagons and harvest seaweed. Then they'd take it home and dry it and grind it and use it as a food. Have any of you gone to harvest seaweed yet? <laughs> Recently, in your lifetime even? Um, it's an interesting concept. But let me, let me put what I've just been talking about on the, on the, the board here. Sometimes a visual. Uh, if we graph this, and this is your age down here, just as an aside, are you familiar with the Khan Academy? This is a K H A N. This is a uh, an amazing thing that's going on. This is a fellow that. Uh, is a, he graduate degrees, I think, from MIT and Caltech. But he made enough money that he's essentially retired. And he, he had some nephews or nieces that needed some help with math, and they were in New Orleans, and he was in Boston or someplace. And so what he did, he made up a little program and started teaching them math. And he just did it on a little board like this. And you don't rarely even see him, you just see the board. And he started teaching his... Um, nieces and nephews math via the internet. And he started off with one plus one, and he goes now to advanced calculus. And you can get those lessons on the internet free. And he doesn't want to charge. He, he seems like just a wonderful person. He said uh, once in one interview, he said, when someone asked him, why don't you advertise and make some money in this? He said, I've got a beautiful wife, a hilarious kid, a decent house and two Hondas. What more can I want? I, <laughs> What a, what a good attitude. Anyway, but, he, but go to the khanacademy.com dot com and, and sign up. If you, I've got a 14-year-old girl at home who's struggling with her math. She'll go down there and work by herself for two hours on this without any intervention by me. I don't have to bug her. She goes down there. It, it's a, could do it. Anyway, it's free. Okay, if we graphed your age here and you're getting older in this direction, and here's your level of health. Okay, now, most of us at some time in our life are pretty healthy. We're, we're the healthiest we're ever going to be, and so we'll start right here. And as we age, this line kind of tends to go down and has some dips and doodles, but generally it goes like that. Now, the angle it goes, now the objective in life is to live like this and then die quick. That's what we all want to do. We want to feel good until we die. Now, the difference between here is the degree of nutrition. Now, let's, let's ex exclude for the time being falling off a roof or getting run over by a car. We, those, those are factors that we can uh, talk about later. But this is the usual case. And unfortunately for us, and fortunate for the medical industry, we don't die quick. We're all living pretty long in this country. But if you look at the profit margin for the pharmaceutical industry, the medical industry, you see we aren't dying. We can keep you alive. And that's just very typical of the fellow that had lung cancer. And he, uh, he felt they better give him chemotherapy, which probably cost him uh, uh, several thousand dollars. But anyway, this is the pattern. Now, if you want to be up here, then we have to look at this other graph. And that is, here we go. Here's your, we'll call this your health over here again. And this is the amount of any particular vitamin or mineral that's essential for life. Now, you can probably, as you increase your level of that nutrient, your health gets better until you reach a point up here where this amount is all you're going to need for optimal health in a particular area, if we're talking about magnesium or whatever. Now, when your life gets crazy, like everybody's life is crazy, your need for these nutrients goes up. And so to get to the same level of health, you're going to have to take more of those nutrients. 
most of us don't do that. We see people running. That, that's a great way to lose magnesium. We run and then we drink Gatorade. And I think if you look at the label on Gatorade, you won't find a lot of magnesium. But this is what's happening. Everybody's life is stressful. And so it takes more of these nutrients, and most of us have recognized once we get past about 20 or 30, that when life is stressful, we're much more likely to get sick. Now, if, if life is great, you have a good retirement program, you've got a happy family, and no one's giving you any trouble, you feel good, then it needs less of those nutrients to get you up to that level of health. So where you are in this other graph, you know, healthy, dying, and we're going down this way. If you want to be up here, you've got to be up here with the right amount of nutrients. Okay, now if you keep that in mind, you can see why <coughs> most, if not all, chronic conditions are, to some degree, a vitamin mineral deficiency. When we live in the environment we live in, our needs go up because we need more of those nutrients to compensate for MSG, for the synthetic carpets I live on. Uh, if you're near a, a highway or a freeway, if you put, it just, it's, it's everywhere. You can't, the cell phone you carry around, uh, just a thought, don't carry your cell phone up here. <laughs> and although there's debate about whether or not the Earpieces cause brain cancer. Uh, I personally feel it's best to err on the side of caution or take lots of vitamins and minerals to help compensate for that. Unfortunately, once you get Parkinson's, once you get Alzheimer's, once you get any of these neurodegenerative diseases, we aren't very good at treating it. So let's pick a disease. I mean, we can pick any disease we want to. What's, what's a common disease of old age? Uh, Dan and I have talked about <laughs> For example, diabetes or something like that. What causes diabetes? Well, your body can no longer keep your blood sugar under control. A whole lot of bad biochemical things happen when your blood sugar is high, and many of them are due to high levels of insulin. But if we look at this <coughs> chart again, how much chromium is taken out of the bread you're eating? About 40%. That's a lot of chromium. So, how many of us take chromium in our vitamins and minerals? Very few of us. And the other problem is we our, our diets are, are not good. Our diets are, are poor. Um, Jeanette Walker, the nurse practitioner who was helping her for a long time, uh, one of the things she said frequently to the patients was, <coughs> would you eat a dead mummy? And most of them would say no. We said, well, most of the processed foods that we eat are, are similar to a dead mummy with a few vitamins added to it. In the old days, uh, many of you have never even heard of Wonder Bread, you know. And when I grew up, it was the big thing, the white package with the red, blue, and yellow dots on it. <coughs> and they, they're, they're, the big uh, thing was build strong bodies 12 different ways. But what they forgot to tell you is that they took out 50 things that would help build strong bodies and then gave you a dozen back and they say it's enriched. <coughs> that's a little ludicrous, but that's, that was their advertising mantra and it, it got a lot of publicity and everybody's eating Wonder Bread. <coughs> so we have to be smart enough. Uh, I was recently chastised by the medical board because I was treating people with testosterone when their testosterone was still in the normal range. Um, I tried to explain to them, but when my children come home with a D, I'm concerned. I don't want to wait until they get an F before I do something about that low grade. And it's the same way with testosterone. It's the same way with your weight. It's the same way with your blood pressure. It's the same way with your blood sugars. Uh, if we wait till you're in the, quote, abnormal range, it's going to be much more difficult to uh, correct the problem. The deficiencies will be that much greater. Your habits will be more deeply ingrained. Uh, and so 
The trick is to learn these principles, to learn the principles of good eating habits, learn the, the principle that aging is malnutrition, learn how to prevent that aspect of aging by providing your body with the things it needs to maintain your health. Uh, my, one of my favorite sayings is, if you don't take care of your body, where are you going to live? Well, we're still going to be stuck there, but it won't be fun when the roof's leaking and uh, there's mud in the carpet and, uh, and the sinks drip and the toilets don't turn off. That's not a fun place to be, but that's where many people end up overweight, hypertensive, tired all the time, stiff joints, constipation, then all of a sudden they have a lump or a bump someplace. The trick is to start making changes when you first get beyond your level of health, for most of us, somewhere in high school. Uh, so many people are overweight in this country, it's just considered part of growing up in this country. You gain weight, but that's, that's not true, it's not healthy. So if we took, for example, something like <coughs> diabetes, why does one person's pancreas wear out and, and other people's don't? Well, there's some genetic problem to that, but it's very difficult to, to distinguish between what, the, what is usually labeled nature and nurture. In other words, were we born with a, a condition that we have no control over, or have we learned be eating habits and behavior patterns? Uh, it's difficult, but either way, if, if it's in your family, if my dad and my granddad have both had colon cancer or prostate cancer, I should be thinking my risk of getting one of those conditions is going to be greater than my risk of, of, for example, having a stroke. And I can learn enough about prostate cancer that I can be doing some things to reduce that risk. That's the only way we're going to stay healthy. But we get back to diabetes and things like that. If I have a strong family history of diabetes and, and I'm 10 pounds overweight, I need to do something about it. And it just isn't exercise. You need to, to get on to some, I guess we might call them alternative websites. Go to Mercola.com, go to Julian Whitaker. There would be, we have a local uh, person here that's written a book about diabetes called David Tanton. And he's got a website or you can look him up in the phone book and get his website. He's written a, a book about uh, controlling or preventing or reversing diabetes. And he's had some quite successful uh, individuals that have worked with his guidelines and been able to control it. Uh, but you've got to, don't wait, your health is too important to leave in the hands of your doctor. I saw a very humorous uh, little story, maybe I can get it right. Um, a young engineer came out of his office about 5.30 one evening and he, he ran into the CEO uh, standing beside the shredder with a document in his hand. And the CEO said to the engineer, this is very important. My secretary's gone. Can you get this machine to work? And the young engineer, of course, knew how to turn it on. So he turned it on and, and the CEO placed the the paper in the machine and the paper disappeared and the CEO looked at the engineer and said great I just need one copy the point <laughs> the point of that story is don't assume that your doctor your mechanic your your plumber knows what he's doing question him uh, uh, learn enough about what he tells you that you can make an educated choice uh, because your health is critical. And if you lose your health, uh, unfortunately, doctors are mainly trained to find a medication or, or to operate on you. Or, uh, it's changing slowly, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the policies and the finances behind the medical industry are, are well, let me give you an example. Uh, 30 plus years ago, there was a movement to, because at that time, osteopaths were sort of considered second-class doctors. I don't believe this, I've got a son in osteopathic school. But about 30 years ago, the osteopaths were, in California, were given an opportunity to become MDs, to have an MD by their name. And they paid a, fine, a, a fee, and, and then they were called MDs, and many did. 
Well, now uh, my son in osteopathic school complains that they don't teach manipulation. Very little time is devoted to teaching the skills that, that osteopathy um, was so successful in. Now, there's a movement to do the same sort of integration with the chiropractors and the naturopaths. In fact, there's a program up at the medical school to integrate these people with medicine. Unfortunately for us, what that probably is going to mean is that chiropractors learn to prescribe medications and naturopaths begin to prescribe medications and they lose some of the uniqueness in their particular profession. And if you have to learn pharmacology, you don't have enough time to learn uh, naturopathy or chiropractic. And so we're going to gradually, I'm afraid, see an integration is the euphemism they're using, an integration of these alternative methods of treatment with traditional uh, prescription medication. And people are going to suffer. It's, it's going to cost uh, the taxpayer uh, much more money and uh, health will be poor. So it's important. To, number one, the number one principle this time is if you give your body a chance, if you quit doing those things to it, they're making it bad. If you provide the nutrition that you need to correct the underlying deficits, uh, then you have a much better chance of uh, recovering or staying healthy. And we want to stay on this line up here. So, and die quick when you're 90 or whatever you choose to do. And uh, did you have anything else you want to cover, Don, Dan, I think? Well, you might mention, um, you know, up there in Salem, the, the, I think the main reason that they pulled your license was because you were not prescribing drugs, was that well, it? Well, no, that's, that's never the uh, overt reason. It may be a covert reason that we, unfortunately, we don't get honest answers uh, from this agency. Uh, the, the board hasn't taken a final action, so I don't know, but the, the attorney for the board recommended to the hearing officer that my license be revoked and that I'm never allowed to practice in Oregon again. And that's because I suggested that a patient take thyroid, didn't, didn't prescribe it, and it was alleged that I failed to do a prostate examination on two people when the chart notes documented very clearly that I had done that. And uh, so I'm not sure what's going to happen. We'll learn in the next few weeks. Hmm. But in the meantime, we're, we're here stuck uh, unemployed. And, and so, uh, so we've got, anyway, that's uh, my license. Initially was revoked for, uh, it, it gets so convoluted. They, they, they change the charges and then, and then they twist things around and then they add charges. But initially my license was revoked um, the original charges were using thyroid and uh, cranial sacral therapy and ozone and, and this, this thing. This is what got me in trouble. What <laughs> <is> Electroacupuncture. <laughs> it's called a Dermatron. Uh, very dangerous because uh, I touch your finger and it gives me an uh, electrical readout. So it's not a... Anyway, I quit using it, but they st persisted. Uh, so I, I'm not sure exactly why they take my license away. Uh, they want to. They don't want me to practice anymore. No one's been hurt. No one's complaining. Well, no. What exactly does that machine do? Does it tell if there's something wrong? With well, it? all it does, it measures for inflammation. And we've got the same machine here as so an updated computerized version. Uh, you can't see it. Or maybe sometime we can go through a demonstration of how it works. But basically what it is, it looks for inflammation. And, and even the major medical journals now are saying inflammation is the cause of disease. When you get diabetic, you're getting some inflammation here. When you get arthritis, you're getting inflammation in your joints. When you get a heart attack, it's inflammation in the blood vessels that create the problem. Hmm. So what this does, it uses acupuncture meridians, traditional acupuncture meridians, and basically it's a fancy ohm meter. And this is the, this is the, the measured it. And when you uh, hold the ground and then you send an electrical charge to a person, if the reading is high, it's like there's very little resistance, which is associated with inflammation. When the reading is low, it means there's degeneration, which usually means scar tissue or damage. And so basically, we could just go through the traditional acupuncture meridians and find out what part of your body was inflamed. 
So if you had uh, inflamed uh, in the large intestine, we'd have to say, well, uh, there is a possibility that you may have some form of colitis or enteritis. Or... And so then we could actually test different remedies and different ideas, foods for example, to see which ones have to neutralize that reaction in a homeopathic way. And so it's a very safe, non-invasive, inexpensive way of identifying problems. Hmm. But it's, uh, unfortunately it's different and when you, when you do things differently, uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure what happens to the thought processes of people that, are, uh, that don't understand what you're doing, but it's very, very safe. Developed by a German in the 70s, uh, brilliant guy, but it, it, that was my license the first time, and this time I'm not sure. What about this other machine that, that puts pulses of electricity into your body that cures you know, all kinds of different diseases? I, I forget the guy. Are you talking about Rife? Yeah, right, the Rife machine. Well, that's another, that was called a square wave generator. And that has a very interesting history. Uh, he was working with a group of doctors in Los Angeles 60 years ago and was curing all sorts of diseases. What he did, he developed a microscope. He wasn't a doctor, he was a mechanic. But he developed a microscope that could see in living tissue what electron microscopy now sees, but it kills it, dead tissue. And he actually tested different frequencies against different types of uh, organisms and, and found the frequency that was what he described as a lethal frequency. And he found that you could very safely treat people with this square wave at a certain frequency and people got better. So it was fascinating, but here again, uh, he was asked to sell the patent to someone and he refused to do that, then all of a sudden he was put in jail for practicing medicine and the machine disappeared. <laughs> so it's, it's unfortunate, but, but there are square wave generators, generators out there and you can buy books with the, the alleged frequencies. You know, I don't know if they work or not. They're very, very safe. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they cost about fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars $2,000. You know, I, I think if people want to try that, you know, one of these days we'll talk about muscle testing as a means whereby you can test these things before you buy them to see if they're compatible with your situation. Maybe one of these uh, days we'll just go through a real quick muscle testing. You did, you filmed one once upon a time, a long mm -hmm. time ago. I but, still got that. Yeah. But we didn't get permission from the people involved to, to put them on, so. But we can do it here. It won't take. It isn't. It isn't complicated. It just it requires practice. And courage. <laughs> and endurance. <laughs> but but see, it gives you that liberty. See, if you understand, if you, if you have the knowledge that these things are available. Uh -huh. And you understand the principles behind them, and then you have the courage, to follow what it teaches, you're going to have a whole lot more freedom. Yeah. See? I understand the Rife machine, that people were getting cured from cancer and just all kinds of different um, right. diseases, but they put him in jail and de destroyed the machine or did something to it. Yeah. There are there are a few people now that have those machines. I see them you can You can get one. I, uh, yeah, you can, you can still get them. They're, they're available. Uh -huh. And uh, and they still have, I think, he's written out directions for different diseases yep, too. Yep, he's got the frequency the use, or the sequence of frequencies that uh, how how authentic they were. Were they actually the ones rife did? I I don't know how to check that authenticity. Uh -huh. But here again, we go back to muscle testing or dowsing, and you can test that out for yourself. Okay. Yeah. What makes that funny noise? Oh, that's a <laughs> that's a heat. It's in the it's, it's a little. The fan down the basement in the, on the heat, it does that. But then you go down and wait for it to go on, it doesn't ever go on. <laughs> Maybe it just needs to be oiled or something. Yeah, but you can find out where to oil it. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Well, I think we've pretty well covered a lot of things there. Okay. What's your website now? drgambe.com. drgambe.com. G-A-M-B-E-E. -E. Yes. Uh -huh. and, uh, and is that where you go to get your newsletter? That's where you can go to sign up, and you can sign up for what we have. We have a weekly email, sometimes more often, and a monthly newsletter. You have to log in and register, and that way it'll, it'll come to you automatically.